Okay, so um, I am here to talk about molecular pathology. It's going to hard follow Dr. Chin um, because I agree with her that a lot of the things that we do for clinical care are now only a small part of what we understand about cancer, and so you have to wonder if we're doing a good job. Um, but today I'm going to talk about two technologies that we're using to try to inform our care of patients who have melanocytic lesions. Um, and we'll go over them. Okay, so I, doctor, let's see, how do I go? I have no financial disclosures, unfortunately, and no conflicts of interest. Okay, I'm going to start with atypical melanocytic proliferations. Uh, Dr. Phelps uh, talked about this during his talk. I think you said you got palpitations when you looked at spitzoid neoplasms. Is that correct? <laughs> Um, and that's why, because they're a very uh, difficult, not, not only diagnostically, but it's hard to understand that what you see under the microscope and how it's going to actually happen to the patient. So what I'm going to try to discuss is an ancillary test that pri provides prognostic information. So you can have a child who has a spitzoid lesion, atypical spitzoid lesion, and have a lymph node, sentinel lymph node metastasis, but it doesn't mean the same thing if you were an adult with a sentinel lymph node metastasis as melanoma. And so it's really a challenge to help uh, the family understand what to do with these patients. So this started in the 1990s when Array CGH became available. Array CGH is a technology that allows you to look broadly across the genome for copy number gains and copy number deletions. So rather than doing fish probes to see if something has amplified or deleted, you can look by these DNA arrays to see this. And you can see here that in melanoma, Copy number gain, this is on Boris Bastian's work. Melanoma copy number gains um, were noticed to be um, repetitive in melanoma on 1Q, 6P, 7, 8Q, 17Q for gains, as well as 20 in losses and those other listed. And so this was true that it held for melanomas, and these variations were not seen in nevi. So here we had a marker to distinguish melanoma from nevi and a genetic test to be able to do that. Um, this prompted Dr. Bastian to see if he could bring this into the clinic. Obviously, I listed a lot of variations in gains and losses, and it wasn't clear which ones were most important. So they did a number of studies where they gathered a lot of cases of melanoma and nevi and applied this technology by using fish probes because it's much more cost-effective and easy. So they selected some regions and used various combinations of them to see which ones were most informative in separating melanoma from nevi not really prejudicial about what genes that we're covering, just using the different probes. And I just showed this to you to see that you don't need to see this, because I know I sat in the back. You can't see these very well. These are just a list of various combinations of probes. And these are ROC curves. And what they did is want to find one that was most discriminatory. And in doing that, they found a four-probe set. It covered fish for 6P25, 6Q23, CEP6, that's chromosome enumeration probe. That means the centromere probe. So you can see that you have chromosome 6. It doesn't say anything about the genes under it. And 11Q23. Importantly, one of his points was, is we do, histology is subjective. And you can have different opinions, and two different people can look at the same case. But when you're looking at quantifying fish probes, it's really a quantitative assessment. And it can be pretty standardized and used by all people. And so maybe there's some truth, quote unquote, in it. So this um, test correctly classified their melanoma set versus nevi with a sensitivity of 87% and a specificity of 95%. So they thought that was a good test to be able to use for difficult melanocytic lesions. Um, they then applied the test to a cohort of 27 histopathologically ambiguous tumors, which would include spitzoid neoplasms. And they saw that it actually could differentiate those as well. So those that tested negative had a long period of time where they had metastasis-free survival. But those that tested it positive for this four-probe test had a worse outcome. And they thought that that would be good. But when they actually looked at only the spitzoid neoplasms, they saw that the sensitivity wasn't that good. So that they weren't really picking up a perfect discriminator for spitzoid neoplasms as they were for other melanocytic neoplasms. And so they went back to work again. So um, this is a paper that came out in 2013, which again has 
um, Pedram, Jer Jeremy, and uh, um, lots of famous people, including Klaus Busem from here right at um, Memorial, where they took, gathered 75 atypical spitzoid tumors with ha at least five-year follow-up from multiple institutions across the US as well as in Australia. So it was a multi-institutional, a collaborative program which allowed them to get these numbers. The patients aged and ranged from two to 58 with an average of 20 years. They used the same four fish probes that were in the prior study, but they added two more that they found were added increased information. Again, not prejudicial in picking the probes, but just doing a combination to find which would be most, most discriminatory. Importantly, I think you'll see that they chose this 9P21. Um, when Dr. Singh was talking earlier, he was talking about the importance of the CDN2A uh, pathway and mutation analysis, the loss of this gene that encodes P16 is correlated with melanoma, and it's also found in patients, um, some patients who have familial melanoma. So this proved to be a very important discriminator. And they added 8Q24, MYC, not because it was important in melanoma, but they needed another site to help them control for tetrapoidy. So if they're only using a few probes and all of the chromosomes are amplified, they won't realize that it's actually not amplification of certain regions, but all of the chromosomes being amplified. So they needed to pick something that often wasn't amplified. And so I, that's why this 8Q24 is. I, being a hematopathologist, I was very excited that MYC was in the mix, but I discovered that it wasn't because it's MYC. OK, and then the criteria is, is they take, they circle the area that looks like it has the most atypical uh, cells. They count three or less of those areas, so at least three separate areas on the slide and they have to enumerate only 30 cells. Isn't that cool? 30 cells only to give them a little taste of what this tumor is. OK, the thing that's, I think, most complicated about this is because they did this in an algorithmic manner and they looked at it statistically, the actual criteria that you use for counting is terribly confusing. So a positive result with, for the homozygous 9P deletion, and this is important, it's homozygous. If it's heterozygous, it doesn't mean a thing. We have to lose both copies of 9P21 to have any prognostic indication. And their studies have actually looked at just hemizygous and it doesn't make a difference. So you have to lose both copies of 9P21 and it has to be in more than 29% of the 30 cells that you lost, or 60, I mean, you're looking at 60 loci. And, but then when you go to the next one for copy number game, it's more than 29 copies or it's more than two copies that have greater than two copies or more than 55% that have more copies of this, this marker versus the chromosome 6 marker. So there's incredible algorithm. So your cytogenetic fish readers have to be very patient and follow this um, to be, so that we can actually use the criteria that's being uh, used. Of these 75 patients, 11 of them had advanced local regional, meaning beyond the sentinel lymph node disease, distant mets or death. So three of these 11 people died of their disease. And they all had a positive fish test with at least of one of these loci. And nine of the 11 had homozygous 9P21 deletion. And in those patients, even though a positive result is more than 29%, those patients had an average of 80% deletion. So the take home message is deletion of the, of two, a homozygous deletion of 9P21 has real prognostic significance in spitzoid lesions. <coughs> They stratify the rest of their patients, and so I just told you that this is now the, considered the highest risk fish test for spitzoid lesions. If you have 6P25 or 11Q23 gain, it's intermediate risk, and those lowest risk ones are 6Q2Q3 uh, or no copy aberrations whatsoever. And these are predictive to help prognosticate people developing advanced local regional disease or even distant mets. Any questions about that? Okay, so Dr. Phelps shared an example with me. This is a 13-year-old boy who had a lesion on his knee that we saw at Mount Sinai. Um, you can see that even at this power, there's a lot of atypical lesions. If you look on higher po power, you'll see there's these epithelioid clusterings of atypia. And I have um, a higher power. This is looking scary to me. And it, and it, and it did it, and it went all the way down to the, the bottom. Look at Garrett's face. <laughs> um, and, and so it didn't stop. So 
So he was very concerned about this and sent this for fish analysis. And we did that algorithm that I just told you about. And the result is an increased copy number 11Q23, which is an intermediate prognosis. Okay? The patient went on to get a sentinel lymph node biopsy. And what do you see? You see a cluster of bat cells. And in case you didn't see them well, this is an MITF1 immunohistochemical stain. So this 13-year-old child does have a sentinel lymph node involvement. But with this intermediate prognostic score, we're hoping that that means that he'll be one of the bad actors. Is that how you interpret it? Yes. Okay. What do you think, Julie? Yeah? OK, so we're glad he doesn't have the 9P2 one. And, and he's being followed now, as do you know? As far as we know, he's being followed. OK, so this is a, a pattern. So these get routinely just sent to the lab, and we do fish, and the turnaround time's about a week, and we can add it up to the report to help with patient care. Um, I just wanted to bring up that we don't know anything about a lot of these tumors. And so look at this. You know, so <laughs> now, now spitzoid tumor, I didn't know this until I started working on this talk. Spitzoid neoplasm has all these kinase infusions. You know, and we were just talking about, Alex was talking about how you have the same mutation in different genes, uh, different tumor types. Here we have, we do, I do ALK and ROS translation, uh, tr translocation readouts for lung cancer, and here they are all loaded up like ROS, the various um, five prime regions being displaced, and ALK in spitzoid tumors, right? And we have a whole bunch of kinase mutations. Now, it turns out when you look at this um, across a different spectrum of spitz lesions, it doesn't differentiate worse prognostic indicators than others. But I think if we get into an era of potentially needing kinase therapies with this, this would be interesting. And I know more, know more about this, and maybe Dr. Friedlander has some insight, or maybe not. So anyway, so we're continually learning. And all of the information that Linda Chin brings to us, it takes years for that to filter in into the clinical arena. And you don't really, it's hard to, you have to do these studies to find which ones are actually going to be useful or not as ancillary tools. OK, that's all I have to say on atypical spitzoid lesions. And I'm going to now move on to melanoma and how molecular diagnostics is helping in there. We've um, shown that the mutations that are known in melanoma are spread around in a la curtain from different sites. So we have different mutations that are prevalent in cutaneous, where BRAF kits more common in the mucosal and acral. Um, but what, uh, what drives me to do mutation analysis in the laboratory is therapeutic options. Because in this era of targeted therapy, these mutations are most important because they can decide on which tumor, which trials, and which patients um, will get certain drugs. And so although they may be helpful diagnostically, they're most helpful um, for guiding therapy. Um, I wanted to show this because one of the things that it brings up is we do a, a variety of single point mutation analyses in the laboratory. But there's a lot of other changes that are going on. So a lot of these other genes that are now thought to be the 13 most mutated genes don't get looked at in a lot of clinical laboratories. And how they integrate with making subsets of BRAF mutant things are not really clear. And this, this wild type or triple negative group has a lot of copy number variation and structural rearrangements, which are also not looked at. So we don't really fully analyze these things as well. So there's a lot more work to do. Um, but I just wanted to show you, um, I'm setting the stage for the fact that molecular diagnostics labs have changed over the past year or two, where they used to do A, B, RAF tests and A, K, RAS tests, to now doing panels of testing. And the reason is because with these studies, we're learning that there's an array of variants that we didn't look at before that have impact. And so we need to do broader panels. So just in this example, we see that the majority of BRAF mutations are the B600E, which you all know and love. Um, but there's some B600K, and there's K601E. So we need to be able to interrogate all of these for Dr. Friedlander. Same thing with NRAS. The NRAS that's common in colon and lung cancer are codons 12 and 13. But in melanoma, it's codon 61 although there's some 12 and 13 as well. And then the wild type, or the triple negative group, are the ones um, that have the kit GNAQ and GNA11 that we know, as well as those multiple things. So now we want to broadly test for all of those variants in um, one test to be cost effective and efficient. And I got an email that I'm late in signing out one, so I'm going to have to leave right away. <laughs> um, so we um, at Sinai and many other laboratories have instituted these hotspot mutation panels where we have one test where we look at 
um, hotspot, meaning regions that we know within the gene that are often mutated in cancer, across 50 genes at once. Um, we mix, we barcode the patient samples. We can run the colon and the lung and the melanoma all in one test. We can interplay 12 different patients at the same time. We interrogate 2,800 mutations in these genes in one test. And I put stars on the ones that we discussed what we know are relevant um, to melanoma. Um, this is an example. So um, Dr. Chin showed how you align the sequences to the human genome. And she was telling you that that's what happens in, in the whole exome sequencing. It's done the same way in this hotspot panel. So this is the, the normal human genome. And each line, each of these gray lines have grayed out the normal parts of the gene. It's all aligned to the human genome. And so the only thing that shows up in this vision of the IGV, which is a, a, a way for us to visualize it, is anything that's different than normal uh, shows up. And so this is a uh, variant that we're in the, in the B600. So this is exon, uh, codon 600. It should be CAC. And you can see the A has been converted to a T and a C to T, C to T, just like that UV signature. Um, so this is a BRAF B600K. So this patient would be a candidate uh, for therapy. Um, and this is, can be done. The, it's three days of sequencing and then a day and a half of analysis. So it doesn't take that long. We report our, where our reports are evolving. We're limited by what we can do in, uh, in our limb system. But what I've chosen to do is put all the important variants up front. So the variants that we know that they will use for clinical treatment we put at the top, so this person's positive for that and not for kitten and RAS. We do a little bit of talking. But then we also report variants that we don't know that aren't necessarily important for clinical care right now. But there's a beta-catenin mutation in this patient's melanoma, and it's on the patient's record if it's something that's ever needed. And it's OK with New York State that we do that. So I'm just ending um, again with this profile from this genome atlas saying there's a lot more work to do. There's a lot more technologies we probably needed to do in the lab to bring the most information, but we want trying to balance it with information that's actually can be utilized in the clinic right away and that's cost effective because there's not a lot of money in this work. And that's all I have to say. Any questions, please?